one thing we can all be certain, we will all die eventually. But when you do depart, how would you like to be remembered? No one would have been more surprised by the public's reaction to her death than Diana herself. The vista of flowers, the scribbled, handwritten notes, the sobbing and the tears, mass mourning and terribly un-British. Kensington Gardens was a sea of flowers, six, seven foot deep, as people of all ages, backgrounds and religions came here to make their offering to Diana. What had happened to the notorious British Reserve? Why had the stiff upper lip been replaced by a mass of quivering lips? In actual fact, our awkwardness over death is a recent phenomenon. Death in Britain traditionally has always been florid, overblown and extravagant. So where did it all begin? The Romans brought the art of the commemoration of death to Britain nearly 2,000 years ago. They knew full well how to remember their generals and their emperors. One of the most touching gravestones of the lot was found here on Tower Hill in the 1930s, and it records the grief of the widow Julia Pascarta, whose husband had been the tax inspector of Britain nearly 1950 years ago. The Romans were practical as well. They used to put their cemeteries well outside the city walls for reasons of hygiene. But, rather touchingly, these cemeteries were close to busy roads because they didn't want the departed to feel lonely. When the Romans left in 410, many of their social and domestic skills went with them. Burial in the Dark Ages, other than for a handful of chieftains, seems to be nasty, brutish and short. But the incoming Christian church soon realised that controlling death and burial gave it added power here on earth. By the Middle Ages, the funeral service was well and truly established, but only for the powerful. And even then, where you ended up depended on how well connected you were. Really important people were buried inside cathedrals. Canterbury Cathedral is the home of some of the country's most famous tombs. Here, amongst the serried ranks of the archbishops, is also to be found royalty. Edward Plantagenet, the Black Prince, scourge of the French during the Hundred Years' War. Why was he called the Black Prince? Possibly because of the colour of his armour, but more likely because he was always in a foul temper. And there you can see, on the side, the famous Prince of Wales feathers with the motto's Ich Diener. But of course, Canterbury Cathedral's most famous resident is Thomas Beckett. For over 300 years, Thomas Beckett's shrine stood behind me. It was a gorgeous concoction of gold, emeralds, rubies and sapphires. In 1538, however, Henry VIII's henchmen destroyed it during the Reformation. Up until that point, it had been Europe's premier tourist attraction. Pilgrims would travel hundreds of miles, telling stories on the way to pass the time, hence Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. All churches and cathedrals had their own relics in order to attract visitors and their donations. If necessary, they would manufacture them. Goodness knows how many pieces of John the Baptist's foreskin were on display. Canterbury Cathedral boasted the arms and the heads of saints and even the bed of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Today, we swap John the Baptist foreskin for admission fees, cathedral shops and cafes in order to keep the tills ringing. It's all about winners and losers, isn't it? If you are victorious in battle, you end up with a fantastic memorial in a cathedral or an abbey. What happens if you're defeated? Well, here is where King Harold of 1066 ended up. After the Battle of Hastings, his delightfully named girlfriend, Edith Swanleck, brought what remained of him here to Waltham Abbey and he was buried behind the high altar. He was originally buried inside the abbey, but in the 1540s, when the abbey was reduced in size, poor old King Harold found himself outside in the cold in every sense of the word. For most of royalty in the Middle Ages, funerals were grand ceremonial events. The body of Queen Eleanor, wife of Edward I, was carried shoulder high from Northampton to London with a huge crowd lining the route. Where the corpse rested overnight became known as the Eleanor Crosses. Her last overnight stop was here at Charing Cross. <laughs> 
For lesser mortals, however, death was a rather more modest affair. Most of us ended up in the churchyards, or God's Acre, as it was sometimes called. Hopefully we were on the south side, because the north side was the devil's side, reserved for murderers, suicides and unmarried mothers. Churchyards in the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries tended to follow the same layout. You will often find simple wooden structures at the entrance to churchyards. These are lich gates. The word derives from the Anglo-Saxon lich, or corpse, and it was here that the burial party met the clergyman and the funeral service would begin. The burial party made its way from the lich gate to the church, down this wonderful avenue of yew trees. Why yew trees? Yew trees offered protection from the wind and the rain, as well as keeping straying cattle out of the churchyard. They also provided the raw material for the longbows of the famous British archers. Painswick Church in Gloucestershire is famous for its 99 yew trees. Every time they planted the hundredth, another has withered and died, so keeping the total to 99. Originally, there were few memorials inside English churchyards. Instead, a communal cross did duty for all of us. Gravestones were only introduced from the 17th century. We were buried with our head in the west, our eyes looking towards the east, the rising sun and the resurrection. And suicides were buried north-south. Coins were sometimes placed on our eyes just in case we had to pay to get inside the kingdom of heaven, Peter's pence. As the population increased, space became scarce. We were simply packed in one on top of the other, which is why English church churchyards, like cakes in an oven, had a tendency to rise. Families would display their wealth by the splendour of their graves. The bigger the bank balance, the more elaborate the tomb. Funerals for the wealthy took time to organise. The bodies decomposed, hence our expression, stinking rich. It was prestigious to be as close as possible to the church. And in fact, one epitaph in the West Country reads, Here lie I, by the chancel door, they put me here because I was poor. The further in, the more you pay, but here lie I, as snug as they. In the 17th century, the richer you were, the more jewellery and trinkets would be placed in your coffin to keep you company. Because of this, churchyards were often protected by imposing walls with spikes to keep out coffin thieves and even body snatchers who would steal corpses to provide would-be surgeons with specimens. In the 19th century, Charles Dickens calls St Olives the churchyard of St Ghastly Grim because of the walls, the spikes and high up above me, the skull and crossbones. Now most people look at the skull and crossbones and feel unhappy. You're supposed to look and feel joyous. The skull means we die, we rot. The laurel wreath means, however, we rise again from the dead. And what are the bones? They are thigh bones, the minimum physical requirement to lever us up at the day of judgment. But what if you didn't want a church burial? This is Bunhill Field Cemetery in the heart of the City of London, opened in 1666, Britain's first cemetery. What's the difference between a churchyard and a cemetery? The churchyards were owned and controlled by the Church of England, so if you were buried there, the money went to the Anglican Church. If you were a non-conformist, you wanted your money to go somewhere else. So when they opened Bunhill Field Cemetery, very many important non-conformists, artists, writers, poets, all ended up here. Two of the most famous are just to be found there. Here is the final resting place of William Blake, artist, poet, visionary, and the man who gave us Jerusalem. And isn't it wonderful, more than 150 years after his death, people are still placing flowers on his gravestone. Alongside William Blake is the grave of another world-famous author, Daniel Defoe, the man who gave us Moll Flanders and Robinson Crusoe. His real name was Daniel Foe. And what Daniel Defoe did, he put the duh in front because he thought it would make himself a gentleman. Isn't it interesting that even though they didn't want to conform, they all still wanted the traditional style gravestones? <laughs>
by the time of the Industrial Revolution in the early 19th century, a whole new breed of wealthy businessmen arrived on the scene. They wanted the world to know just how successful they were, both in life and in death. Many Victorian industrialists and manufacturers scorned a church burial. Why give money to an institution they did not support? Instead, they wanted to display their wealth in spacious new cemeteries. And if those cemeteries were commercial and profit-making, then so much the better. Bradford's Undercliff Cemetery, right at the heart of the Industrial Revolution, contains the last resting places of many hard-faced Yorkshire businessmen, more than happy to proclaim their worldly success. The Illingworths were a great Bradford textile dynasty, and here they stand side by side in death. Alfred's Egyptian-style mausoleum, complete with sphinxes, was regarded as the height of Victorian fashion. You can almost hear him saying, big in life, but even bigger in death. We might feel a little uncomfortable walking around cemeteries. The Victorians didn't. They regarded them as moral and educational amenities. Families used to come to these cemeteries and they would often have a picnic by the graves of their dear departed. They would sit there, have their cheese sandwiches and feel closer to their loved ones. Victorian London had its own commercial profit-making cemeteries ranged around what were then the outskirts of the capital. I call them the Magnificent Seven and they flourished in 19th century Britain as the population exploded and more and more well-to-do Victorians wanted impressive last resting places. Kensal Green Cemetery was the first and the most fashionable. Why? Because three members of the Victorian royal family are buried here in Kensal Green. The best one of the lot is Princess Sophia. Now what happened to Princess Sophia is a very sad story. Her father was the mad King George III, and I'm afraid his madness extended to not telling his daughters about the facts of life. An innocent game of cards with a courtier got out of hand, and nine months later she had a baby. But we think, in fact, she'd been raped by her nasty older brother, the Duke of Cumberland. With three members of the royal family buried here, then the rich and famous of Victorian London were bound to follow. Here is the rather fine memorial stone to Blondin, the tightrope walker. He found fame and fortune by going over and over and over again the Niagara Falls. Now he realised after the first time he did it, people would get bored. So he resorted to various novelty tricks to make sure that the world's attention was always focused on him. He used to go across with a table and chair, stop. He would then cook himself an omelette and carry on to the other side. Incredible. I think the most incredible thing about Blondin is he died in his bed. This is the Grand Avenue Kensal Green Cemetery. This was like the Park Lane of the 19th century. You had to pay an awful lot of money to be buried here alongside the avenue. Just take the mausoleum behind me. It belonged to the circus performer Andrew Ducrow. It cost 3,000 pounds. You multiply that sum by 30, 40, 50 today and you can understand how incredibly affluent Ducrow must have been. As a circus performer, guess what has pride of place? The ringmaster's hat and gloves. Behind me is the grave of Mary Gibson. No one knows who on earth Mary Gibson was and why did she deserve such an elaborate memorial. It was in fact even better than it is today because if you look in the middle, the angels originally were holding a wreath. Sadly, the wreath has been vandalized and it's had to be removed. Otherwise, it really would be quite something. This is the Brunel family grave. The third name down belongs to Isambard Kingdom Brunel the great Victorian engineer who gave us docks, steamships and bridges. Look at the very simple memorial. I kind of think Brunel's legacy is all around us. He didn't need to show off this very simple inscription, this very simple grave is all he needs. Incidentally, you can probably just about hear in the background his other great creation, the Great Western Railway is just over here. Behind me is the Anglican Chapel at Kensal Green Cemetery, and just look at the size of it. What a magnificent classical building. Why is it so grand? It was basically saying to people, if you bury your dead here with us, they will be safe. The catacombs behind me can hold 4,000 bodies. 
Infant mortality remained high throughout the 19th century. Little Sarah Elizabeth survived just 17 days. But in fact, her fine memorial is an exception to the rule. Most children would have ended up in unmarked company graves because their parents were not able to afford their own plot. Perhaps the most touching children's epitaph of the lot is to be found at Linton in Devon. It reads, Opened my eyes, took a peep, didn't like it, and went to sleep. Death became a lucrative business in the 19th century. Businesses undertaking the funeral event sprang up all over Victorian Britain, pandering to the grandiose desires of their wealthy clients. Lavish rituals, including hearses drawn by magnificent plume-clad horses, coffins adorned in crepe and jet jewellery. The ostrich feathers were a reminder of the plumed helmets of dead medieval lords. Hard spectators or mutes would swell the numbers at the funerals of the unpopular. All this was organised by the undertaker, and he charged a princely sum too. For those with no money, there was very little choice. Simple municipal cemeteries like this one in Leeds. Beckett Street Cemetery was Britain's first municipal cemetery. Opened in August 1845, the first interment was that of a nine-year-old child. You can tell that run by the authority, money was not the main motive. It doesn't have the same wonderful monuments as that of many of the commercial Victorian cemeteries. But every cemetery has its monuments of interest. Here, three generations of the same soldiering family are commemorated by the helmet and the cross swords. Behind, the oldest steeplejack in England, Thomas Kidney, died in his bed at the age of 82. And there's the factory chimney. But what happened to you if you were really poor? Paupers were heaped together in mass graves, remembered only by simple wooden crosses which soon rotted and decayed. The poor kept their dead at home while funeral arrangements were being made. But because it was thought to be unlucky to sleep upstairs with a corpse downstairs, people used to invite their friends plus a few bottles of whiskey around to get themselves through the night. The memorial to beat all memorials is this one. What a Victorian celebration of death. Here is the Victorians at their most extravagant. Queen Victoria's memorial to Prince Albert was opened in 1872 and cost the equivalent of 25 million pounds. A 150 foot extravaganza designed as the equivalent of a medieval tabernacle, with yards and yards of gold leaf and intricate carvings and mosaics. Prince Albert sits atop a sea of artists, painters and composers. On each corner are sculptures depicting the four continents. Queen Victoria insisted George Gilbert Scott, the architect of the Albert Memorial, should be present too. He placed himself modestly at the rear. Queen Victoria's own funeral was a huge international state occasion. Victoria died at Osborne on the Isle of Wight in 1901. Her body was brought back by train to Victoria Station across London and then off to Windsor to be laid to rest next to her beloved Albert in the specially designed mausoleum at Frogmore. Following Victoria's death, the mood of the nation changed. With the population growing, space dwindling and the public reacting against 60 years of florid and overblown Victoriana, attitudes to death changed. People now felt able to choose. And they chose cremation. Modest and simple, a complete antithesis. Golders Green Crematorium opened in 1902, our first supermarket of dispatch. It has ushered into eternity many notables. Like Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, and that delver into the unconscious Sigmund Freud. However, it was the First World War which really numbed our enthusiasm for the lavish funeral. One and a half million people died between 1914 and 1918. With nearly every family in the land touched by tragedy, it was considered unseemly to harp on about death. <laughs>
The Sword of Remembrance was designed to be simple and dignified. Equality of sacrifice rather than ostentatious display, it carefully avoided religious or Christian elements. Neither did gravestones differentiate between officers and men. Rationality, not spirituality. Tietval Memorial in northern France was designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens and commemorates 72,000 men whose graves were unknown. The First World War extinguished our appetite for elaborate funerals for nearly 80 years. Our grandiose funeral tradition started to re-emerge in 1965. Sir Winston Churchill's death united the nation in grief. His funeral was a solemn state occasion, with thousands lining the route in silence from Westminster Hall to St Paul's. Nowadays, as people are more aware of death, as modern medicine is better able to tell us how and when we will die, we have time to prepare for more elaborate funerals. Even powerful and imaginative epitaphs are back in fashion. Look at the inscription on the grave of Labour MP Bob Cryer. It ends with a poem. Do not despair for Johnny head in air. He sleeps as sound as Johnny underground. Better by far for Johnny the bright star to keep your head and see his children fed. Diana's death took the world by surprise, but it gave the nation an excuse to unite and to mourn. Her body was carried northwards up the M1 to the Althorpe estate, a kind of Queen Eleanor in reverse. She could not be buried inside the Spencer family local church because the authorities were worried that her grave might become a modern shrine with pilgrims paying homage and chipping relics off the memorial. Back to the Middle Ages, in other words. In many ways, our ability to openly mourn, celebrate and commemorate death has never been extinguished. Rather, these emotions have slumbered, waiting for a major funeral to fan the flames of our traditions and take away our relatively recent embarrassment and awkwardness. Who knows, perhaps the British way of death may well be coming back into fashion. Thank you.